How many times has a nil pointer reference or just a nil value in your Go application bit you in your behind? Probably more than once if you have written Go code in any sort of production environment with real users. And that is just what happened in this great article posted three months ago by a deleted user. Probably not a good sign. I don't know. 972 upvotes. Go nil panic and the billion dollar mistake. And I'm going to get into this. I'm going to read it. However, if you may be thinking a billion dollars, that's a lot. You can see that with an estimated revenue loss of about 100,000. Where is this billion coming from? This is a term coined by Tony Hoare. Tony H-O-A-R-E. In summary, Tony introduced null references in ALGOLW back in 1965 simply because it was so easy to implement, says Mr. Hoari. He talks about the bad decision considering it my billion dollar mistakes. Null references have historically been a bad idea. Uh, super interesting kind of presentation link in the description below. So basically what this is, is any sort of time you see the billion dollar mistake is when you have a problem that is wrapped from focus on referencing a nil or a null value. In Go, they are nils. At my job, we have a few dozen development teams and a handful doing Go. The rest doing Kotlin with Spring. I'm a big fan of Go and honestly, once you know Go, there's no going back. <laughs> It doesn't make sense to me to ever use the JVM. So I started a push within the company for the other teams to start using GoTo and a few started new projects with Go to try it out. This is great. This individual is leading and showing initiative saying, hey, Golding is great. We should use it. Here's why. And other people picked it up. I love it. Fast forward a few months and the team who maintains the subscription service has their first Go app live. Ooh, it's basically a microservice which lets you get user subscription information when calling with a user ID. So you pass the user ID, it gives you their information. Okay. The user information is fetched from the DB in the call, but since we only have a few subscription plans, they are loaded once during startup to keep in memory and refreshed in the background every few hours. Interesting. So upon startup, they are loading these subscriptions, saving them in memory of whatever instance this application is running, and then probably have some polling service or maybe a, a cron, whatever, that is refreshing these every few hours. Maybe there's an, a change or I don't know, seems like, seems odd. Why would you need such rapid information subscription plans, but hey, whatever. We're not talking about this. If you guys like Go and this kind of content, make sure you click subscribe button. It does help the channel a lot. A lot of effort goes into these videos and it truly is the best way to support if you enjoy. But let's get back to the video. Fast forward again a few weeks and we're about to go live with a new subscription plan. It is loaded into subscription services database with a flag visible equals false. And we brought live later by setting it to true and refreshing the cache data in the app. So I'm assuming any data that's in memory or anything like that. The data was inserted into the database in the afternoon. Some tests were performed and everything looked fine. Hoping these tests were also performed before you loaded anything into the database. Later that day in the evening, when traffic was the highest, one by one, the instances of the app triggered the background task to reload the subscription data from the DB and crash. The instances try to start again, but they load the data from the DB during startup two and just crash again. So, okay, not good. Within minutes, zero instances are available and our entire service goes down for users. Alerts goes off. People get paged. Support team is very confused because there hasn't been a code change in, in weeks and the IT team is brought in to debug and fix the issue. In the end, our service, the subscription service, the new Go service was down for a little over an hour with an estimated revenue loss of about 100,000. Again, 100K, not billion, nil error. That's what it is. So what happened? When inserting the new subscription into the database, some information was unknown and set to null. The app using a pointer for these optional fields. So let me explain what this is before we're moving forward when you have a struct that has a type that is a pointer or whatever asterisk and it could be whatever if that's not set the zero value for that is nil and while transforming the data from the database struct into another struct used in the api endpoints a nil d reference happened in the background task and the app panicked and quit when starting the app the app got the same nil issue again of course because it's still the unknown type and just panicked the mean so upon tried to refresh restart it constantly kind of went into this nil d reference loop and it kept just quitting and panicking. So think of it this way. We have some sort of type. You want to convert it to a uh, another struct, like they say, like an API struct. I, I don't know why, but let's say that happens, right? And there is a method or some sort of reference on the field in that struct, but because it wasn't able to unmarshal or transform correctly in the transformation logic, whatever could have happened. And the API struct, when it was calling the method or calling that field, it was nil. When you call a nil field, you panic. You get that runtime panic error that a lot of Go developers 
scientists know about. Basically, it means a pointed to a nil for a pointed object. Naturally, many things went wrong here. An experienced team using Go in production for a critical app while they hardly had any experience using a pointer field without a nil check, not manually refreshing the cache data after inserting to the database. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing that shocks me, this is your team's first time doing a Go application. You go with like a database layer or something that interacts with the database. That is ballsy. That, that's confidence at its highest peak. But the Kotlin guys were very fast to point out that this would never happen in a Kotlin or a JVM app. First, in Kotlin, null is explicit. So the null dereference cannot happen accidentally. But also, when you get a null pointer exception in a background thread, only the thread is killed and not the entire app, okay? To me, this is a big eye-opener. Eye I'm pretty experienced with Go and was previously recommending it to everyone. Now, I'm not sure anymore. What are your thoughts on it? Mostly, I think having years of experience helps the Kotlin team at least as much as features. Being new at something is always harder. I agree. Now, there's a good link to something made by Uber Go. Uber's open source software for Go development. It's called Nil Away, and I have not used this. Nil Away is a static analysis tool that seeks to help developers avoid nil panics in production by catching them at compile time rather than runtime. Nil Away is similar to a standard nilness analyzer. However, it employs much more sophisticated and powerful static analysis techniques to check nil flows within a package as well across packages and report errors providing users with the nilness flows for easier debugging. Sounds pretty good. This is really, really nice. From what I can read, this is a way to handle nils and so you don't actually have those mistakes, the one referenced in that uh, Reddit post. Interested to see how it works. Let's, let's see if there's an example here. Basil build. We, so cool examples. Let's look at a few examples to see how nil way can help prevent nil panics. So example one, var p is a pointer. If some condition, print p. Nilness reports no error here, but nil away does. Ah, that's pretty cool. Very, very nice. Example two, who is a pointer. Uh, this will return nil. Maybe ask yourself, why would this not truly return nil? Nil reports no error here, but nil away does. Uh, I want to lead you to here. Why is my nil error value not equal to nil? Okay, I'm going to explain why. Or I'm not. This article is. Under the covers, interfaces are implemented as two elements, as type T and a value V. V is a concrete value such as an int, struct, or pointer, never an interface itself, and has a type T. For instance, if we store the integer value 3 in an interface, the resulting interface value has schematically T, type is int, V, value is 3. The value V is also known as the interface's dynamic value, since a given interface variable might hold different values v and corresponding types t during the execution of the program. An interface value is nil only if the v and t are both unset. For example, t is nil and v is not set. In particular, a nil interface will always hold a nil type. If we store a nil pointer of type pointer int inside an interface value, the inner type will be int or pointer int regardless of the value of the pointer. So you can see here, the type is this pointer int, while the value is null. Such an interface value will therefore be non-nil, even when the pointer value inside is nil. And there's a really good example right here. This situation can be confusing and arises when a nil value is stored inside an interface value such as an error return. So var p, the pointer of my error, and we're saying that to nil, if bad, so something if something bad happens, p equals error bad and return p, will always return a non nil error. If all goes well, the function returns a nil p. So return value is an error interface value holding t pointer to my error type and v is nil. This means that if the caller compares the returned error to nil, it will always look as if there was an error even if nothing bad happened. To return a proper nil error to the caller, the function must return an explicit nil. So at the end here, if something bad happens, we're going to return the error bad type. Otherwise, we return nil. So we can do our if error does not equal to nil. It's a good idea for function return error types always to use the error type in their signature as we did above rather than a concrete type such as a pointer to my error to help guarantee the error is created correctly. As an example, OS open returns an error even though if not ill, it's always a concrete type. So this is an example of why sometimes an interface or a value that is pointing to something uh, and you call it may not return an actual error. Summarized everything. This is a really good article by Code Fibers HQ. I'll leave a link to it below. Uh, but here, the confusion comes, and this is kind of what could describe this go nil panic scenario here. The confusion comes when one wants to use a construct like this. So again, var p is a pointer to int, var i is just this naked interface. We're assigning i to p, and if i does not equal to nil, print not a nil. 
the code outputs not a nil. What happened here? We can clearly see, and based on previous rules, that both P and I has value nil, but the condition is evaluated into false. It's not a bug, but it's a legitimate Golang behavior. What you should know is that interface is the reason of all the mess. The structure behind Golang interfaces holds two values, type and value. So there you go. This is exactly what we saw in the actual frequently asked questions of the go.dev uh, documentation. So with all that being said, make sure you're very careful with handling uh, nil values. Be as explicit as possible. Remember, always try to handle your errors as values. Panics and nils gets a little trickier. But yes, I think this is one of the points of go with nil handling that is a bit of a pain point. I can't lie. I can't really go into the full defense mode of go here. I've been bit by this, especially, you know, dealing with maps that weren't properly uh, declared or instantialized. You'll definitely face this if you try to just a add a value to your map, uh, but you didn't really instantialize it. Bang panic because uh, it's a nil. Have you ever dealt with something like this before? How did you handle it? Did you use any sort of framework? Is there a pattern that you're using? Make sure you comment down below. I'm super curious to hear what you have to say. And as always, if you're not comment, liking, subscribing, I don't know what you're doing. We do so much go content here. Show us some love. And as always, you gotta power it.